screen. Okay, perfect. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Unher Outsider. I'm your host, Q, coming from South Puget Sound Community College. I'm the assistant director to the A. Barbara Clarkson Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Center. I have two amazing women of color in the room um, that's just been about this work. And today's topic is around intersectional pedagogy, um, but also decolonizing curriculum which is the bigger conversation now that a lot of institutions are having about how to implement anti-racist work in the institution when we've been talking about this for a long period of time. But before we get into the room, I'm going to allow both of these amazing people to introduce themselves. Um, I'm gonna start off with Dr. Hastings. If you let people know who you are and what you do. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. I'm Dr. Rachel Hastings. Uh, for the last decade, my students have dubbed me Doc. And so uh, I go by Doc in the classroom, out of the classroom, across the state of California. Um, I am a professor of communication at Miracosta College in Oceanside, just a little bit North County, San Diego. I'm also the director of the North County Higher Education Alliance, which is a consortium between Miracosta, Palomar College, and our sister institution, CSU San Marcos. Um, more importantly, I'm invested in the community, right? I'm invested in us, I'm invested in the students. I've been um, in higher education for the past uh, 18 years. And so I'm really happy to be here and a part of this conversation. Thank you. And without further ado, my awesome fam, Dr. Taylor. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, first off, Dr. Rachel Hastings says she's been doing this for 18 years when she looked 21. I just don't <laughs> understand that. I know you guys have to Oh, no. See this, but I'm like, how? You just turned 21. <laughs> I wish. Um, I am Dr. Clark's <laughs> Right. <laughs> I am a, a neuropsychologist and I teach psychology at South Puget Sound. This is my one and a half year, I guess, going on there. I'm fairly new uh, to the community. Uh, prior to that, I taught at an engineering university at Michigan Tech, uh, teaching uh, human factors uh, engineering, which is the fancy way of saying psychology of engineering, right? And prior to that, I was a fellow at Illinois Central uh, College, Community College in Peoria, Illinois, which I was a fellow for two years and an adjunct a like, year prior to that. So um, I think that like, just like uh, Doc indicated, you know, uh, I want to be respectful of everybody calling a doc. I want to do the same. Uh, uh, indicated that uh, the work already had began before I even got my degree, right? Uh, just being a woman of color and treading into academia, uh, not knowing the trailblazers before me and the challenges before me, right? So before we even began to think about uh, the integration of curriculum you know we lived in it we mm. experienced it we was exposed to it so i think it made us uh even more um just just pioneers to be able to get when we got in the positions to implement things in a in a way so it began before we began right so yeah we're ready yes we are <laughs> <laughs> no this is great and it's in one of the first questions that um, I usually ask is, when was your first experience as a student or just living through, navigating through the world where you realized that you didn't really see yourself right within that classroom, the way it's being taught? Like when was your first experience where it clicked for you? and how things were being taught, what was being taught, how you were picking it up. When when you recognize like, ooh, like I'm not really, it's not clicking. Like, you know what I mean? I know mine, but I'm really interested because I know you all are so invested in this work. Like growing up, when did you realize like, ooh, this really ain't for us, right? Uh, right. I, 
it's so funny that you asked that because there are like 27 different moments that come up because time and time again, you are reminded of exactly who you are and the struggle of going through this intellectual journey of just being black excellence, you know? Um, so first I have to say that um, my mother is Filipino. My father is African-American, black American. And so I've always known that I was somewhat outside inside, you know, that in between space. Um, in high school, I was in a um, humanities and international studies program. So it was an accelerated like program that prepared you for the four year institution. And we knew straight up, even though you had quote unquote um, books from Toni Morrison and Gabriel Garcia's Marquez and Isabel Allende that we still were not quite part of the group. I can remember specifically giving a senior presentation on Toni Morrison, who was my queen writer of all back then. Like I was so in love with her work. I read like everything that she had put out and I gave this presentation. And I remember there was this uh, Jewish cat in the class. His name was Ari. And he was like, but when is she going to write about people who, you know, are not black? Right. And my response to him was, um, why would she ever have to do that? Like, this is her experience. She should write from the lens of her experience. Why would we expect her to write outside of that? Um, I, I went on, my paper got a B. I took my, like, you know, my B. And I was, like, you know, still top of my class, still did very good in high school. But I re revised the research that I did in that class, like, three times on the college level and got nothing less than 100% on every single research paper that I turned in at that college curriculum level. So I think back on those high school times, like, We've, we've always been marked as outsider, right? The question is, are we going to accept that outsider position? And, mm. and throughout that journey, the part of the reason I got this PhD is because no, we don't accept like nothing less than, you know, what we are owed, if you will, right? So that, that's the one I think that immediately comes to mind when you ask that question. Thank you. Wow. Powerful. Yes, yes. I will, um, I will have to say that growing up in the um, inner city of Chicago, um, my experience was completely different, right? You, you don't get that experience at all, right? Um, I didn't have uh, educators in my community that looked like me. So I would think that not even just the decolonization of curriculum, mm -hmm. but just the decolonization of the classroom, yes. you know, the, the professionalism of what your goals could be, right? When you don't see a person um, that can, you can relate to, right? That can relate to you. And even in, even if it's not about race and culture, but socioeconomic status, right? right? Yeah. Just the entire disconnect of those things. So I can say that feeling uh, marginalized Mm -hmm. Right. Um, being a part of this um, expansive, marginalized group, I never it wasn't until my um, I would say that my at Northeastern Illinois University, where I did my undergrad at um, in political science, by the way. Right. So imagine that uh, curricula. Uh, there was no person of color spoke about in poli sci uh, at all with my undergrad or my master's in poli sci, even in Greek philosophy. Right. Right now, they kind of integrate bell books, which which women feminism. But that's still, you know, that's a portion of it. But there's nothing um, the, to mimic or give hope to um, a contribution in curriculum. Uh, mm -hmm. of people of color, right? Um, so I can, I, I will never forget uh, Russell Benjamin, uh, a Southern guy from Alabama, or Florida. I don't even remember where Russell was from, but I know he just <laughs> never had lotion on and I might and I think that he was rusty, y'all. And if you ain't of color and you don't get rusty, then y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And uh, he went to he went to University of Florida. He used to say all the time. He used to always talk in our in our courses in poli sci. He in in any integration he would bring up African American politics and colonization, right? Mm -hmm. And at that time when I was doing my undergrad, he was writing books or a co-authors of books on colonization, colonization. And I'm like, what is this dude talking about? Because it was foreign, right? Mm -hmm. Being being colonized was foreign to me. And I was an inner city hood kid, mm -hmm. you know? So it wasn't until my collegial, my first collegial experience, and uh, I kind of latched on to Adopt the Benjamin 
right, to learn more. A, because I couldn't pass his class, guys. I kept getting it. You know. uh, needless to say. But furthermore, because I was so interested in his passion and why he was so passionate about colonization, why he was, why he broke the rules and in, in, um, in my other courses, I was learning about Aaron Erdhard and all of these amazing people, but no one of color and how he would implement things in, in a political framework that was people of color and how he integrated, uh, you know, policy that looked like, you know, social economics and how I began to even look at King as more of a, a capital pioneer, the way that the Montgomery bus boycott was and how that changed uh, policy, right? You know, so it wasn't until that, and that is very unfortunate. Yes. It is very unfortunate that it took all the way until my collegial experience in just that one. You know, I always think if I never had Russell Benjamin out of that department of hundreds, you right. know, um, would my experience, would that have shaped me completely different? Right? Would it have shaped me different? So I would I would say that um yeah, it's 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 very taxing to to know that even myself coming into higher ed, and I don't know about doc, but oftentimes I am the only, right? At SPS, I am the only. At Michigan Tech, I am the I was the only. And still they they didn't replace me. So once I left, that was it. One and done, right? At ICC, the only person of color in my department, right? And so how do we frame that when we're trying to decolonize this curriculum, but we're the only that think that this may be an issue? Mm -hmm. Wow. There it is right there. There it is. And it's weird too, because when you were talking, it made me think about my situation because I didn't really, one, I never thought that school was an option for me, right? Um, My mom was a single parent, raising two kids in the projects, you know, on all the things, right. Um, public housing. And I love school so much, but we moved so much because my mom was trying to make sure we had all the things we need just to live. And I finally had the opportunity to go to college. And when I went to community college, when I first started, I, it was, it, it didn't go very well because I didn't know, it, I wasn't introduced. It wasn't a conversation at our table. Um, my family, you know, all they did was they worked in um, healthcare. So they were like housekeepers. Like my grandmother did housekeeping all her life. Um, she had like a sixth, eighth grade education. So, you know, all she did was work and clean up and, 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 and that's what they did. They worked in healthcare. A lot of my green aunts and my mom, of course, went into that field as well for a little bit before she decided to go back. But when it was my turn to really go to college, I really didn't tap into seeing people that looked like me, that cared about me, that really was invested in me until I went to Southern Illinois University Carbondale and I was able to really connect with people like Dr. Williams and other like black people and black students that were really hungry and super excited about education. And it's, it, it is unfortunate because I felt like I lost so much from my experience. I lost so much time to be able to say, Hey, start reading these books or Hey, start you know, because, you know, we I had access to the library. I love the library. I love to read. And I would read, you know, but no one taught me like, oh, there's like um, a section for us or just to, or I didn't know that or, you know, get a library card, right? Like we don't, you know, oh and how to access those things. You know what I mean? And so... I just felt like so much time went by and it was like me as a non-traditional student trying to catch up, right? With all the things that are saying. So in my undergrad, I'm like, okay, I mean, okay, Audre Lorde. So I'm reading through like all of these articles and books and trying to, and I'm like, oh, this feels great. And um, it was funny because uh, we jumpstarted our LGBTQ programming yesterday um, and Keith Boykin came to speak. And so... And I told him, I said, your book for color boys 
like change like it it got me through undergrad like when you know for color boys for when the rainbow's not enough like that book got me through because i'm like even going through my experience as a black person but as a black queer person is so different right and so i just felt like i was so behind i was a non-traditional student i had I was up against all these young students coming in straight out of high school. And I'm like, they was like, no, do it. Like just, you know, and so having those people, having people like Dr. Williams and people like, no, like you here, do your thing, you got this. Um, and before I knew it, I was, I didn't even think about graduate school. I'm like, what the, I didn't even know what that was. Yes. I just, all I knew was I needed <laughs> to graduate and get a job. and. I never forget, as uh, Dr. Hastings probably know, uh, Satoshi, and um, and he wrote on my one of my papers. He was like, "If you ever think about grad school," da, 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 and I went to him like, "What the hell is that? My like, what is what is that?" He was like, "Oh, it's you know, you get a graduate degree," and I'm like, "Does that cost more money? You know, like, <laughs> like what is like that? that?" Yes. Yeah. So, and then I, of course didn't think it was an option. I just thought like bachelor's degree, I'm going to just go out, find a job and live my life. Um, because that's what we're, we're told that that is the path that we're supposed to be on, that we're supposed to just be laborious people and you're supposed to get a job, collect that check, pay your bills, and then make sure you don't get in any trouble and don't be a criminal. Like that yeah. is all narrative. Like there's nothing outside of that. I, it's so funny that you, you you said, what is that? That was the exact same sentiment that I had when my professor pulled me to the side and said, you need to get a doctorate. And I was like, what is a doctorate? I'm going back home to work at the community center. I only came here to get a job at the community center. You know, like, uh, I think that, again, we have such parallel paths because that is the singular narrative that they tell us that we're supposed to have. Nobody, uh, at least I'm from the West Coast. So we're only 4% Black people on the West Coast, you know, period. So we don't, you know, we don't have a whole lot of representation when it comes to, you know, higher education. I did my freshman year at Xavier University, and I did that because, you know, a couple Black girls in the hallway, us just talking shop, and it was like, what you mean you applied to an HBCU? Who helped you apply to an HBCU? Mr. Rowe, I'm going to see Mr. Rowe, too. I want to go to an HBCU. Like, right. and then all of a sudden, I'm out in New Orleans at the, you know, only Black Catholic school, you know, the number one school to send African Americans to pharmacy school, having the time of my life, being around, like, brothers and sisters who come from a certain mm -hmm. level of economic status that had never been exposed to before right and and i think the the thing about putting ourselves in each one of these spaces where we are the only one mm. is that we seek each other out right so the the very beautiful thing about southern illinois is like yes i was the only like black sister who was like in my particular graduate program but every single black person that they brought in i made sure i knew them like derek and i came in tight you know, we took all our classes together until, you know, we couldn't take our classes together anymore because whether we think about it or not, this is warfare. This mm. is intellectual warfare. It is our mere survival. I have been the token in the classroom where the white woman across the like room is like, well, the author was talking about biracial people. Rachel, can you talk yes. to us about that? And me having to say, no, I cannot and have to be polite about it. Right, because I have to police my own tone to make sure that they don't police my tone for me because their feelings, those white tears start to kick in and you have to feel, you have to adhere to those kind of standards of, of uh, respectability, those politics of respectability. Um, mm. But it teaches you about yourself. It teaches you what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, what you're gonna stand for, what you're not gonna stand for, and always to have an alternative in case something doesn't work out. Because there have been many incidences where I am given my best and given my all, but because someone disagrees with me, they don't even come and talk to me about it. All of a sudden, I'm not getting a, a, an offer for next year of getting classes. Or mm -hmm. um, some, some you know, 17-year-old white girl who takes my class didn't have certain expectations of talking about issues of race and class and gender in the class. So she goes to report me to the chair next semester. I'm not invited to come back. 
right? It's those kind of things that we have to be prepared for that our, our counterparts don't necessarily have to think about. Um, they have their own issues. I'm not going to, you know, throw anybody under the bus like that, but these are our issues, right? And this is why it's so important for us to have that type of community representation. We got to start hiring each other in clusters, right? Yes. You can't just be bringing in one or another, you know, one at a time because that just sets us up for more trauma. Like it, and it does. It, it does. is a lot of trauma. <laughs> Beyond, beyond trauma, right? And every time you walk into that um, that that war zone, right? Uh, that war zone, you are constantly reminded of the due to the microaggressions that you just spoke of. You know, due to the hostility, right? Due to the underlying implicit biases that are there, right? You know, and uh, oftentimes I think because it's so innate and built in culture, mm-hmm. right? Yes. Um. And, it, and and I feel like this, uh, Doc uh, and Q, if we can't see it amongst our colleagues, then we don't know that we're making that impression amongst the scholars that we're serving, mm. right, in a classroom, right? So mm-hmm. I, I I definitely agree. Um, uh, unlike unlike you guys, my my experience in uh, in education was completely different. I'm a first generational high school graduate. Mm-hmm. My family, right. And so um, my a lot of my um, in higher ed, by the time I get to higher ed and, and was taking classes because I started at a community college and I was just taking so many random classes that um, one of the professors uh, told me like, hey, you know, like, what are you doing? And I'm like, just trying to work enough to get some Jordans. Right. You know, <laughs> and if you saw me in person, that's the truth. Right? You know? <laughs> and so um, she told me about Northeastern and she was like, hey, you got, you have way over 60 some credits. You haven't declared a major. You just have. So I got like this general associate's degree and applied to NEIU um, just all for the hastings of a, a professor uh, in psychology. And um, I mean, like I didn't have any direction, right? Being the first, I had no direction. And I'll never forget when I was uh, completing my master's degree in political science, encouraged me not to go into a PhD program, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, She told me that I will be better serviced in high school, teaching high school. Um, And of course, I'm rebellious. I didn't listen to that. I mean, that's why I'm where I'm at now. So I think when we talk about decolonization, we have to like think about and begin to question the very production yeah. of knowledge, yeah. not knowledge in the text, right? But knowledge of what those biases are that was implanted in that, that will make someone say, hey, listen, maybe you should just go work afterwards, right? Because that's not the same conversation that is being had it with other mm-hmm. scholars, right? That's not mm-hmm. the same experience. Or, yeah. hey, you know, you done well enough. Look, you got a whole master's degree in political science that you're not going to get a job and even if you go into policy with, but you should go teach poli sci in high school, right? You know, doing those type of things. And I think that's why this in conversations like these are important. It's not to um, really gander up attack against any other individuals, because like Doc said, like their experiences are different. We can only live in our right. own lived in experiences. This is not qualitative narrative that we're sharing, right? And it's not, it's not like a uh, conflictual of anyone else's. It's just what our experiences are. I'll never forget when I was leaving Illinois Central College and I, um, I, I do a lot of, um, you know, talks and, you know, people ask me to talk. They just like me. I I'm, I'm think I'm funny. You know, uh, I try to be <laughs> hilarious. And um, um, I was doing a conference, a national conference at University of Austin, Texas uh, for NYSI. And a woman came up to me. She was an administrator. And she said, hey, we closed out our hiring um, committee, just closed out. But I want you to apply. And I'm like, lady, I'm still doing my fellow. I have no interest in applying. And this was in, um, in, in, um, in what was it? Pensacola, Florida, right? At Pensacola State. 
And like, she hounded me. She hounded me the rest of the conference. She hounded me the next day after that, the next day after that. I said, okay, lady. So I sent in my stuff. I applied. I became one of the finalists, right? And I never forget um, because no one else had seen me, right? All they had done was seen me on paper. So I won these, all of these awards, right? So on paper, I was someone completely different. And I never forget when I walked in there to do my teaching demonstration, uh, the department chair never looked up. And when she did, she never said anything else. She, she wouldn't have make eye contact with me. And um, once I finished my teaching demonstration, I was praised at how well a teacher I was. And then it was questioned my legitimacy of my, of my degrees. So we have to think when we're talking about decolonization of just curriculum, we have to go further and just, just to scale it back and decolonize the thinking of our individuals in academia before they even begin to create Come a on. syllabi. Come on. <laughs> you know, because that, that, I think that's the issue. We can change curriculum okay, all we well. want to, but if it's the same mindset that's teaching any mm. curriculum that's changing, you're going to have the same issue. You're going to have the same conflict. They have to want right? to do the work too. And because doing this type of decolonizing work is not something that you could just train somebody to do. Mm. Right. I have exactly. a, another, um, you know, colleague of mine who posted on her Facebook the other day and she was like, you know, you can't train the racism out of somebody. And I was like, say a louder for the MFs in the back. OK, <laughs> because at the, at the end of the day, this past year has taught us that we can train people and have trainings and have webinars and have symposiums and have like workshops over and over and over again and still meet those same microaggressions, you know, that Dr. Taylor was talking about. Um, just in the simple conversations of how we just relate with one another, mm. right? Like they have to do the self work, right? And communication, when we start out with interpersonal communication, we start with the self. Like if you are unable to comfortably talk about your skin and what that means in our society, then you could never be a decolonized individual hiring people and, you know, sitting on hiring committees, trying to make a more inclusive environment. Right. You have to do the work. And that's something that, you know, again, Southern Illinois taught me, you know, deeply that if we as people of color have expectations of our, our white folks out there of changing, we're going to continuously be disappointed. Right. We have to let go of our expectations just because we explain our our personal narratives are from a qualitative perspective doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to be internalized and counter what their qualitative personal narratives happen to be. Right. Mm -hmm. This is not saying that we won't be able to build intercultural relationships. It's just to say that if you want to be a peaceful person in your own sensibilities and in your own self, those types of expectations really have to be like thought out, you know, very clearly because you're going to be disappointed over and over again. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, it, oh, I definitely agree. It's interesting to me because it's interesting because I know, you know, me and, um, me and uh, Dr. Taylor, we, we know we work together in the same school. And it's interesting because I work in a center. We also are doing a lot of trainings, a lot of workshopping, a lot of, a lot of, a lot, a lot, you know, mm -hmm. and one of the things that I've seen, and, you know, I've talked to my supervisor about this, that as, you know, it's like, and also just other people that's working at other institutions and in DEI work. And I'm like, are y'all institution, like, like, is there like an increase of like, we need you you know, how, you know, help us. Um, there's a, uh, yeah, you know, and that's where we are. We're in the workshopping, we're in the training, we're in the trying to the shifting the thinking. And it comes to a point for me and my experience being in it every day. And is that there is a point where enough has been given to you to move on, to do yeah, better yeah. for yourself. Because if I'm using everything I have to help you and don't save some for myself, like this ain't gonna, this, like, I'm a burnout at my job. I'm not gonna wanna be here. And the list continues to go on. And it's not that, you know, I don't like what I do. But the thing though is that 
there's still things that you just still don't want to change. There's not, people don't want to be accountable for their inappropriate behavior or how they yeah. do things. People don't want to own their own shit mm-hmm. and, and how they do things. And, you know, I struggle with that, you know, and just in D I work not, and I'm like, we need to be, it's kind of like, why are you sitting here lying? You know, like it's one of <laughs> You know you you know you did that right i mean at some point you don't want to call them out anymore because you just are being observant and right. and another one of my sister docs yeah. she told me best when i was at siu she said you know what when somebody you know shows you their true colors believe you me. believe them mm-hmm. and that is that right and i think that i would never ever say don't do workshops don't do trainings I, i'm a part yeah. of that community like of course yeah. we're going to do those things we want to create a better world yep. but i think you're 100 right q like if you asking me to give 100 and you ain't giving 100 i'm not giving 100 this ain't slavery yeah. right like, this, is, this is not i'm gonna go as far as you go and i'm not gonna push you any far beyond that unless you're willing to push yourself beyond that and yeah. i'm always here to have the conversation but if you burn me i will leave you right there yes and that's, that's the way right. it is you know so there's this expectation that black folks are, you know, supposed to apologize for that uh, when everything is connected, you know, like everything's <laughs> like, is that me? <laughs> but, um, you know, there's the expectation that we are the experts. Mm. We want to be called on, right? But that being said, we don't want that black tax, right? If we are not paying me for my labor, if you're not paying me for my, you know, my intelligence, if you're not um, giving me like, you know, something that makes it worth my effort, then my joy is so much more important than that. Yes. And my peace of mind is so much more important than that, right? Like, I, uh, you, know, you know, there was a wonderful professor that I had who, who would say, well, teach us. No, no, thank you. I'm not going <laughs> to teach you anymore. Like I have been speaking. I have been talking. You all are not listening. You all are not internalizing. You all are not like in, engaging in a way where you're doing the self work. I'm working really? and I'm not doing that anymore. Now that does, again, that doesn't mean that, you know, if you put it out there was like, this is what we need from you, from your expertise. I'm so 100% open to having that conversation. But beyond that, where it's like, can you do the work for us? Mm, no, I learned from my ancestors. That's just ain't gonna happen. <laughs> I appreciate you though. I, I, I believe that like we've created a culture of inclusion thinking has been ex- very exclusionary, right? Mm. And, and blocking, um, you know, especially um, considering this year and the knee jerk reaction of of impeding of all of these new policies and workshops right. in 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 a response something that should have been already uh inserted in our culture but it, it's a response so my fear especially even talking about like curriculum my fear is that this is temporary this is a band-aid yep. right uh as we had already indicated prior to beginning uh this podcast in this conversation, just the idea that this is not new, right? The idea that none of this is not new. The idea that that um, just today I was reading prior to us getting on here and just a, yet another person of color has been shot by the police, but there is no more marching because cafes are open. And you know, with us, with 75% that have at least one vaccination, uh, people... <laughs> priorities have changed, right? <laughs> when we were all locked down, it was different. It, everything was urgent, right? Yes. So <laughs> we, when, we, when we think about this and we think about these different voices, right? And, and who, we are, who are we speaking for as uh, academics of color, right? Who, who are we? And then how we're viewed when we speak, right? When we're having this conversation, um, I can guarantee you 90% of the people that's listening to this will take this in and say, you know, that was really angry. <laughs> <laughs> Opposed to 
this being a very passionate conversation, because when other people speak about things that they're passionate about, it comes off across as passion. When people of color speak about things, especially things like the colonization and race, it comes out as rage and anger, right? That's what is interpreted as, right? So when we're, when we're looking at this, right, and we're looking at uh, just taking the pedagogy of race, mm-hmm. right, and how that has impact just our relationships in, in our collegial communities. That's extremely important that these conversations are done in a very effective way, that they're done in a way that is very transparent and valid. You know, it's like any research, right? Mm-hmm. If, if, if you want to disprove it, then disprove it. Right. But what we're doing right now is quantitative work. Right. Not even qualitative. We're doing (laughs) quantitative because it's data that is behind the things that we're talking about. If we look at the graduation rates and the retention and completion rates of people of color, it is a great indicator that they don't complete because they don't feel a part of the community. Right. And it shouldn't have to take us to go to Morehouse or Xavier or Florida or 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 any of these HBCUs to feel a part of a community. Yeah. Yeah. It shouldn't take that because our dollars. Right. As 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 consumers, because my (laughs) scholars are consumers. I treat it like it's Disneyland. Right. (laughs) You're going to get the best ride of your life because you're paying for it. Right. (laughs) But a little bit of entertainment, right? You know, I take it from the master of all, Walt Disney, right? This is an investment. And because there is an investment, I am going to take this curriculum and I'm going to break it down into different components, like the best Costco or Walmart or Target that you've been into so that you can get a sample of everything, things that you have never experienced, things that you have been told. And then because it's a smuggish board of knowledge, you can take it upon yourself to expand on that or not, yeah. right. right? But that's not given to us. That's not given to us. We're creating it because we didn't get it. Come on. And that's the issue. It shouldn't take one or two of us to be doing this. It should be a consensus across the board that that's a part of higher ed. Mm. And not just higher ed, that's a part of education. Yeah. You know? So when we, when we look at this, I mean, the fact that in 2021, We are having a conversation about decolonization of curriculum. It's sad. Just as sad as back, like I was watching, I don't know if you guys had the chance to take a look at it, but the uh, MLK and the FBI, uh, uh, it came on Hulu on the 16th. So I took uh, took a look at it and it didn't surprise me, but it really surprised me, right? A lot of uh, the, the indications of everything that's going on and it, it, I just look as, you know, because when I'm watching these things, I'm watching them not as the psychologist, but I'm watching them as political scientists, right? Yeah. Uh, and my poli sci hat kicks in. And the most saddened thing is we can see this, and when we're talking about decolonize, decolonizing at this point, when you have a system, just like the FBI, and I know this is a weird correlation, but I'm going to use it anyways. Oh. You have yeah. someone that was in place for 46 years, Right? There, this the change can't is going to be stagnated because there's no longer a system with 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 J. Edgar Hoover being in place for 46 years. There was no re- way that a person of color, if a woman, could get in the FBI because he wanted them a specific way, right? Good looking because he was gay, right? Let's be real. So he wanted white men that was NF that looked football players, very strong, brown high, brown hair, blue eyes, right? Good looking white males, right? So it was hard to break that system, just like what we're talking about right now in higher ed, whether we want to believe it or not. It is a stagnated system Mm -hmm. and what we look like don't fit the bill we wasn't supposed to be a part of this uh institutionalized uh advancement because higher ed was for white males right it was for the elite it was for those that had money and then you get into that and then you teach because you had money and it's passed down in the james and the williams and all of these wonderful wonderful individuals so we coming in where we're breaking barriers to begin with so we're fighting a stagnated system so when we're talking about decolonizing it goes beyond just changing the content yeah. of curriculum right it's it's adding voices in a way that connects to existing the base that already exists but when you say that then you be viewed as a rebel and then you're asked not to come back the next year mm. then you're silenced you're silenced by non-employment 
Mm-hmm. Right? Which is also an economic barrier. It's right? an economic barrier. Now you have a whole PhD with that $200,000 plus loan. Right, and you have like, a retail store. Right. And right. You, you, have, you have Starbucks now. Right. <laughs> Trying to get your $15 an hour. Paying back those student loans. Right? Exactly. It, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting dynamic because I also think that if you, you know, when you are reared in that type of system, it teaches you to have an ethic of care, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, for me, I know that I don't just teach Black students. I don't just teach students of color. I do have the privilege of having very diverse classrooms, but I make sure that the structure of my classroom, the structure of my syllabi, the content that I present is is not only easily accessible to every single student, but that if you have any hiccup along the way, I'm 100% with you to get you through. Exactly. Right? Whether that's your deadlines, whether that's your grading style, there's a whole movement on ungrading right now, um, mm-hmm. which to me, I was like, what is this ungrading thing? Only to realize that I had already been implementing my own version, you know, in the, the, the process of how I, you know, get people through public speaking, interpersonal mass communication. Like, it's okay if you miss an assignment, you got a uh-oh link at the end of the semester that if you miss it, go ahead and throw it in the uh-oh link so I can get you them points, right? If you do the work, I'm going to score it for you. There's no reason that I have to penalize you or make you feel demoralized because you had to take care of family business or medical business or somebody in your family had COVID. And now you have to explain all your personal business just to be able to turn in, you know, a particular assignment. Right. So I think, you know, Dr. Taylor, you're hundred percent right. It's not only about the content of the course that you're teaching, but it's about that ethic of care that you bring towards each individual student and getting to know them. Um, I have, I teach online. I love teaching online. I've been teaching online for 10 years now. So the pandemic, I leaned into it. I like started making all kinds of content for my students and having fun with my videos where I'm rocking out to them and they, they eat it up like cake because they are so hungry for that type of digital connection, right? Right. But if we don't try to, to reach out and touch them in the age where like we are so separated, then they're not going to actually lean back into us and grow through the intellect because each one of them has a specific goal that they're trying to reach and their own set of barriers that they have going on too. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have to be that network. Right. Uh, That, too, is a part of the decolonizing practice of stop thinking that there's so many categorical ways to divide us up and just start making it easy to say, I'm not a gatekeeper. Right. I'm a facilitator. I'm a medium for you to get to that next place that you're going to. It's interesting because currently, I mean, at our institution, you know, the, the new thing, especially for our department is creating roles, right, for, for, uh, or spaces for people to be, be, but now we're looking at, like, how do we look at syllabi and curriculum, and it's now starting to, like, how do we create a role for this person or this thing now, and I'm like, it's starting to make me, like, one, good, like, I'm happy you now see what the hell we've been talking about, but the other part is, you know, that shouldn't be given to one person. Like it starts to get to my mind of like, it's kind of like, oh, there's an executive diversity officer. Oh, there's a D there's a diversity center. Oh, now we have someone who's not saying that they're going to be the only person, but even when we think about the ways and how we create those roles, right. Mm -hmm. It feels like, um, a quota check Mark. Yeah. System. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm and I'm like no, I think it's it's great, but and, and why aren't people able to do their own work? Like in my mind, that's mm-hmm. you know, and I I don't know, I I I don't know. I mean, I would love to know y'all thoughts on on that. Like, and that's the part for me. Even when I've taught in in graduate school, you know, I had a really rough <laughs> graduate experience. Um, I had. Uh, I taught an honors class for public speaking at Illinois State University when after I left um, after a year and I didn't do well and I, I realized why. <laughs> um, and, you know, I was grading, I graded a paper and as this white, straight kid got pissed off 
because I gave him, I think I gave him like, a, I don't even, I think I gave him like a, a low A, I think it was like a 90% or something. He was like, mm-hmm. I don't think this grade is, you, you, <laughs> so you, you think that like you got a 90%, I just, I don't feel like this grade is fair. Oh, snap at me, snapped at me through email. I said, oh, okay. And then, um, went on to say, you know, my, I had a teacher in my class um, in high school who, you know, a mentor or whatever, who was black. Okay. <laughs> and what does that have to do with me? I'm, I'm you know, every, every black person or every person in particular is going to give you something to think about. Like, right. Right. Um, and he was, yeah. ups- he was upset. I mean, he kept that grade though, but I think I thought it was interesting. I'm like, as a graduate student who's teaching an honors class in public speaking, honors, right? Yeah. You think like, oh, you know, there's not, and I tell any, I told some friends, like, they're like, oh, I'm teaching an honor class. It shouldn't, don't listen. Please don't believe the hype. Like, you will have some challenges as a person of color grading pretty much 90 something percent, if not more, white students. So yep. I was challenged, like as a, as an instructor, like why as did the you expert. Yeah. As, yeah. The expert, as the person who already has their degree, who's teaching <laughs> honors class. Now right. you have the nerve to come to me to say, oh, my, vi- my expectations have been violated because you scored me less than I think of myself. Yeah. Like, let's take a look at the rubric. Okay? <laughs> like, but, but this is also the reason why I think like, you know, some strategy we as people of color in the in the classroom, like have to think about our strategies for that, too, because for me, like I rarely give out like letter grades, like, you know, percentage points, you know, so on and so forth. If you do the assignment, you're going to get credit and feedback. Mm. Right. Like because at the end of the day, I'm trying to avoid those types of challenges and create space to say, Everybody starts at a different place, but we all have room to grow. Yeah. Right. Now you can take my feedback and do what you will with it. But if you don't do this many assignments, I get this many, like, you know, accept like completions, then you're going to be here at the end of the semester. Right. Um, And that has opened up. It's taken the pressure off a lot of students because there are not very many professors. You get that C and you're demoralized because you think that you're not worthy of being in that classroom. Nah, baby, you did just fine. But you have to work on A, B and C in order to elevate to get that to that next level. Right. Um, And that's not just for them, though. It's for me, too, because I don't want to have to deal with that conflict. We don't speak the, the same language. Um, That's not to say that I'm not going to love up on all my students, you know, across their differences. It's just to say I've had some pretty awkward moments with some pretty awkward white folk who don't know how to speak to me because they've never had to speak to a woman of color um, of my stature, like who is their instructor, who is the person who has to like judge them through these grades that we have. Right. Um, And I'm tenured. So I have the privilege of being able to do that. Yeah. I'm not telling y'all non-tenured folk to go out there and just go ahead and change the gradients <laughs> and stuff. Like, you know, please understand. I have about a semester left before I get tenure. So I'll do that like right <laughs> mid-September, mid-September. <laughs> get it, you know, like get that tenure and get that academic freedom, right? Where they can't take it back from you. Um, <laughs> but it is to encourage, it is to encourage us to think about like, you know, what does this grading system do how does it serve us? Mm-hmm. How does it serve the populations that we are trying to elevate? How does it help to decrease those intellectual gaps, those equity gaps amongst the different demographics that we teach? You know, mm-hmm. like if you teach at a 90% white institution, then you probably have a very small cohort, that one person or yep. that one or two individuals that, you know, you have to pull to the side and say, I just want you to know that I'm here with mm-hmm. you 100%, like, let's go. But if you teach where you can see the demographics are a little bit larger, mm. you know, then you have, you, you really have to think carefully about the, the audience that you are, you know, that you're dealing with and you're, um, you're engaging with. I, I, I would totally agree. I think at, uh, at my current institution, well, I'm employed at, um, it, and like most institutions I've been employed at, at, except the Illinois Central College, they have all been predominantly white institutions, right? Mm-hmm. And so, um, although I haven't had any uh, conflictual 
um, or conflicts with with scholars, right? I don't know. You know, maybe it's my demeanor. It's my Chicago demeanor. I don't know. You know, <laughs> uh, I haven't had any conflict with with scholars. My uh, conflict come with um, the mindset, the historical uh, conditioning of of the the staff with a faculty, mm. right? And 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 um, like most, I have to work. 20 times as harder to prove that I belong where I've already earned my right to be. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and I don't think I was talking to a colleague of mine today and I said, you know, um, um, and I was telling them about this conversation that we were having. I told him, I said, you know, decolonization is a metaphor. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and he says, camp, you know, he, he's in, he's K through 12 and he's a, he a, a principal. It's like, Kim, what, what do you mean? You know, I said, because even with the thought, it's real consequences in life that comes behind someone that's trying to implement mm. this, this form, right? You know, it, it is great. You know, it is great to ideally, to ideally think that we would implement this. But historically, historically speaking, it is just a metaphor. Right. It's something that looked good on policy and paper when we go on our board meetings to say that we're doing just like these workshops. And like Doc said, I'm not saying that workshops are, are not great. I think that there are timely and effective if they're implemented the correct way and the correct mm -hmm. content is happening. Right. But I think that the just the, the colonial thinking uh, establishment will never be destroyed and salvaged. Mm -hmm. Right. Because it is the foundation and pillars of academia. Come on. It is the foundation and pillars of our political framework and our and our capital framework. Yeah. Right. So I mean, this this sounds very romanticized to me when yeah. we when we talk about this. You know, I feel very Shakespearean in the black version. I feel very <laughs> black Shakespearean um, when, when we're talking about this because. Ideally, we are doing so many different things to decolonize our classes as people of color, but we're not the one that needs to do the work. Come on. And go. that's the issue, right? We're doing it because our exposure and we know what we would have experienced. That's why it doesn't matter what color the scholar is or what culture they are in front of us. We treat them like scholars because we want to be treated like their professor. Come on. Right? So we're not, we're not the ones that need to work. I don't think it's the people of color uh, for, uh, per, per se, that needs to do the decolonization or the decolonizing, it's others that don't even understand that it exists yes. because it's still been there. It's a part of the historical foundation. And I believe that's the issue, right? Mm. I believe that. I haven't had the privilege yet. And, and me, and I've been teaching, this is my seventh year. I know I'm still a baby in the game. You know, um, this is my seventh year of teaching and yet, have I had a classroom that look mixed with anything? Mm -hmm. I've had scholars of maybe three to five in classrooms. And I'm talking about at Michigan Tech, I had 200 to 300 scholars in one lecture hall. Mm -hmm. And none of them, none of them look See, like that's me. violence right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. none like, of them that's like that's me. violence right there, having to step into a classroom with a large lecture with 300 people and you only have like five people who look like you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, I, you know, uh, again, like uh, that's that there's definitely different regions that have their regional cult and the cultures to it. Like I've taught at HBCU. So I've had all black scholars. I know that there's a diversity of black thought. And so not all black scholars mm -hmm. come to the table the same and you can't treat them all the same. Exactly. I've also taught in Southern California, right next to the Mexicali border where 90% of my students were Latinx. Like, you know, so it's a very different, like, you know, like, um, uh, community one that I still lean into because like I I'm from a very like you know multiracial family and right. so at the end of the day I was like let's go brown people let's get it but they have different different um uh, challenges in terms of when your student is crossing the border every single day just to get their education you have to create space for that right like um i've taught now you know i've taught at the you know predominantly white institutions where 90 percent of the students who don't look like you and don't respect you or what you bring to the table and had to negotiate that um and i think that 
you know, what I would definitely like to offer, because I'm sure that there are going to be white folks who are listening to this conversation, oh. is that in addition to decolonization being a metaphor, it's also a process, mm-hmm. right? Like yes. you got a, a part of loving yourself is forgiving yourself for making mistakes, right? Mm-hmm. If you get called out for, you know, slipping up and, you know, um, being white, <laughs> For lack of a better phrase, somebody calls you on your whiteness. That's not necessarily something that you you should feel like so offended by. You should actually feel thankful that a person of color actually approached you to say, here's the way in which you offended me and how you need to make corrections. Even if you don't like the way that they told you that you were offended because they're giving you an opportunity to make adaptations so you don't bring that same type of trauma and hurt to somebody else, you know, down the line. Right. The, the, the fear that I have in this particular moment is that we're using decolonization as a way to distance ourselves from the real systemic issues of racism that are embedded in the moral, you know, ethical values of our nation. Um, I'm, I'm not going to sit up here and tell you that, like, I'm a reformist. I'm not. Right. I believe in revolution. I think that the foundation of our country was built on racism, not that racism was born out of our country, like after it was already built. You you eliminated the Native Americans, bro. Right <laughs> that right there. Like, you know, like and I shouldn't say eliminate. We still got our indigenous brothers and sisters who are out here like that. But you, we have to understand that we really have some underpinning work. Like we can't just say, well, we implemented this program. We have 15 new positions that are all focused on <laughs> diversity and equity. And we're really trying to get to like, you know, um, change the structural values. But in a Zoom room, you got white students who still unmute and call somebody a nigger across the, 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 the digital Zoom because they feel like, you know, they have the privilege to do that. Right. It's in the culture and the mores of who we are in our social behaviors. Now, you might say, well, that just seems real pessimistic. Like we don't have like, you know, the capability of change. We do. It's just going to take a process. Yeah. Don't expect to wake up tomorrow and expect freedom land for everybody, because that's not what's going to happen. That means every single day you got to do the work. Right. And, it's a simple. And, and don't expect because you read books <laughs> and you attend a workshop that that's putting in work. The no, work is- Patrick Johnson said, the knowing is made manifest by doing. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Yeah. It, it has to be the doing, right? And I, think, and I think that's what I would like to leave our listeners with. You know, this, like, like Doc just said, this, this is a process, but the process begin inward to outward, mm. right? And, and it has to be. It has yeah. to be. Every day when I wake up, I'm not reminded and that I'm a professional and I overcame all of these adversities and I've done this. I'm reminded that I'm black. Yes. I'm reminded that I'm black when I step outside of my Cap Hill door. I'm reminded that I'm black when I'm in an airport and I have to go through three times to make sure that my locks is pulled up because something is beeping. Thank you. You know, I am reminded from a society that all of these barriers have been ingrained in it to be placed on me of my, of the color of my skin, the melanin of my skin, right? Mm-hmm. You know, they don't see Dr. Taylor that's a neuropsychologist when I walk through the doors so or when I walk outside, right? Mm-hmm. How many times I've seen people grab their wallet in the, in the back of their pants or move their purse to the other side of their bag, you know? Um, I'm reminded of that. You know, so if we're reminded, if I'm reminded of that and I have broke barriers down, think about what we're doing in our classroom to our our scholars that we're serving, to our students. What are we reminding them they are? Mm. How are we reminding them who they are? Are we, are we implementing not just in the syllabi, but in practice? Mm. Inward to outward. That's why we should be working. And, and please don't come at me. I, I'm going to say it out loud. Like, please don't come at me when we're talking about we wear our blackness. That is how we are identified. Please yeah. don't come at me and be like, but what about women? Right. But what about like, <laughs> this particular group? we're already inclusive of those conversations? Yeah. Right? Like, yes, I'm a woman, a black woman who gets reminded over and over of that, right? And I understand that we have our queer brothers and sisters. I understand like they're a trans folk who are having their own particular situation. But guess what? Their blackness 
is the umbrella that encompasses those intersections. All of those things, so yeah. intersectionality, as um, popular as it is, is also really, really dangerous mm -hmm. because it continues to divide us. Like we need to stand at the crossroads and not be like, well, let's have the oppression Olympics. This You're is right. not about the oppression Olympics. Let's look at the umbrella, how the system wraps this up and then talk about how, even if you are disabled, you still have an issue of race. Even if you are like, you know, mentally incapable, you still have an issue of race. Even if you have like gender, age issues, sexuality, whatever your quote unquote identity markers are, you still have to do with the issue of race, right? And that to me is like, again, one of the hardest parts of the conversation. You want to talk specifically about race and somebody in the back always wants to say, but what about this group over here? Mm -hmm. We're already including that group over yeah. there. Right. right. It's just another part of the conversation. Don't try to distance yourself from the ways in which racism continues to perpetuate the same type of issues that we go through over and over again. Yes. I'm, you know, I, I'm, I know we are a little bit on time, but I want to ask this question, though, because when it came some, you know, I'm busy all the time. People just see mm -hmm. me all the time and stuff um, was the critical race theory conversation being taught. Like, what did how did y'all even like as in educators like what was really going through your head when that came through on television that they really are trying to get that to not be taught yeah when the trump administration was trying to put the policies like why did it surprise us right exactly. <laughs> like i don't i i i 100% disagreed, you know, with oh, yeah. like the efforts that were being made but under that particular administration none of that was surprising Right. Like no. none of it was surprising whatsoever. Like the, the previous administration, like one over and over and over again, taught us that they were not trying to be inclusive, that they were not trying to be anti-racist, that they were not trying to deal with issues of equity. They were trying to preserve the systems that have been and will always be. Yeah. We're the ones doing the disrupting. Right. Yeah. Like, so when we talk about, you know, qu critical race theory, we talk about, you know, the 1619, none of that was taught to us. Right. We had to sit in the library. I, the Q, when you said earlier, like you didn't know there was a section for us, I kind of smiled on the inside because I went to the Martin Luther King Library in my neighborhood and I only went to the black section. I read all the books in that section before, like, you know, I went anywhere else to find whatever my entertainment was going to be. I didn't even realize I was reading critical theorists like Toni Morrison and like, you know, Cornell West and until I got into like higher education and realized, oh, snap, like these, these, these were some real news right here, right? right, right. Like <laughs> these, these folks that I just happened to come across because I wanted to know where the black folk were in the library. They only had the one little section with their six rows of like shelves. And I must have devoured that section, mm. right? Like, and then after that, we had to search because it wasn't in the curriculum. I had to go out and find the Dr. Smoots and the Dr. Curry's and like, you know, the Shagoon Ajawui's at Southern Illinois to say, I've never had a professor who looked like me. You're teaching this in this discipline. It's outside of my discipline, but I'm going to take your class because I know that I need somebody who looks like me, who speaks like me, who talks like me to give me what I need to be able to survive in this very, very snow field that I am, you know, operating in on an everyday basis. Exist, you know right when 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 i when i listen to you guys i think about um my dissertation and it was on racial battle fatigue mm. right in in higher ed by the way and i kind of examined at that point community colleges in the midwest and now years later as i as i scale it back for myself and I reflect on critical race theory and the implementation of microaggressions and all of this thing and the abandonment of that, right? Um, the number one thing that comes up to me is fear, right? Uh, fear of knowledge, right? Um, I think it wasn't until I got into higher ed that I feel so oppressed as a, as a, as a woman uh, and, and, and a person of color, a woman of color, right? And uh, to be clear, what I'm saying is that I think when you are at the minimum, that you're at the lowest level of the economic scale, you're not a threat. There is no fear, right? But uh, Malcolm, Brother Malcolm, you know, said it way best, you know, that it's not money. It's not Beyonce that they fear, right? It's not money, it's knowledge, 
Right. Um, it's knowledge because knowledge is what opened the doors. That's what makes us very competitive, right? That makes us very, I mean, our fancy degrees, even though people say, I don't mean anything, it, it provides opportunities, right? It puts us on a playing field to be bosses and then boss with a capital B, you know, like you would become bosses, right? Um, and I think that's the thing that, that kind of struck me. I never was surprised, right? Uh, and it wasn't, uh, just Trump. I wasn't surprised by Reaganomics in, in the 80s, even though I was a baby. You know, I wasn't surprised knowing that this is the, the format of our country, right? This is the foundation of our country. This is what we was built on. Yeah. What, what seems to be disappointing still is that we work in a field, right? In an in a, in a area that's supposed to be expansive to thoughts and creative thinking and thinking outside of the box, that we're still confined by the same box, hmm. Right? Hmm. that we still allow our scholars to be spoon fed specific knowledge to think a specific way. Right. Um, I don't get in trouble for a lot of things. The things I do get in trouble for is because of those things I just said. Right. <laughs> I'm expanding on knowledge base that makes you be the thinker. Right. I'm giving you the tools. Right. And, and, and you have the tool belt. So in your tool belt, that might be something completely different than what's in my tool belt, but at least you have tools to do what it is that you need to do to get done, right? right? And, I, and that's, what, that's what strikes me the most, right? I'm very, I'm very spoken, outspoken at the same time, you know, I'm a navigate, I'm a, I'm a pour in, you know, I'm a invest in, but I'm a step back and reflect as well because as as people of color, that's what we taught to do, right? You know, um, Michelle Obama said it best. She said when she, when Barack first um, got, uh, was running for president, they said something really imperative to her. They said, hey, when, don't speak. Now, this is a woman that, that has all the degrees and the intelligence of any first lady, and I said it, a <laughs> first lady that has ever graced that White House. But they told her, don't speak because she will be viewed as being aggressive. Right? Not intelligent, but aggressive. Right? So that 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 keeps that makes me mindful that we still live in a society that 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 is so fearful by our intelligence. Mm -hmm. Right? that we immediately become the enemy, whether that's in the classroom, whether that's what scholars that we serve, whether that's what our colleagues, and not for all, but just for those that just don't have the foundation themselves to understand that we don't want to compete with them. We trying to take our boss's jobs because that's how we was born to do the boss up, right? <laughs> so it's a, it is a complete difference, right? That when we're pouring into the institutions that we serve, we're not pouring in for the president. We're not pouring in for the VP of instruction. We're pouring in for the scholars that we serve because we want what's best for them. Yes. Right? Yes. You know, it is a different mindset when we come to the table. When we having conversations like this, it's not because they come together in black spaces and complain. It's to enlighten individuals to understand the dynamic and the foundation of why conversations like this should be had all the time in a conversation. So we don't have to have these type of conversations. Yes. Right. So I just I just feel like everyone will walk away with something different, but you know, you get fed what you want to, you can spit it up. You know, every baby you can give Gerber to don't like the applesauce, right? <laughs> Some think it's sweet and tasty. Others will spit it right up. If it's not for you, spit it up. Come on. For those that love it, digest it. Keep it in your system. Mm -hmm. Eat some more of it. Mm -hmm. and, th and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to create a space create an a, a, a academic space that we don't have to talk about decolonizing because it's innate. Yeah. You know, we're trying to create a space that we don't have to worry about if it's the color of our skin that's not getting us the employment. Yes. Mm. We're trying to create those spaces, but right now we're not there yet. You mm -hmm. know, um, on, they asked Martin Luther King, how long do we have to wait? 80 years later, we're still waiting. So you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I, it's so interesting, too, because I think that this is so far beyond academia. Yes. Um, and I, I you're correct. We're definitely trying to build spaces within academia because we need to lean into each other. But it is about creating intellectual space. 
yeah. whether you decide to participate in higher education or whether or not you, um, you know, go to a trade school or whether or not you learn on the job or you decide you're going to go into the theater or, you know, F it, I'm just going to open up my camera that I have on my smartphone and become a filmmaker that way. Like yeah. our intellectual and creative like juices need to be able to curate, right? Without judgment. Mm -hmm. without critique without standardization without being you know and it needs to be able to to serve us in an economic way yes right um i don't tell all my students that our academia is a space for them i I'll, i would never tell a student not to get a phd in the same way that somebody told you dr taylor right right, right. but i do tell my students academia is not for everyone everyone mm -hmm. yeah right it's we not need each other up there but it's not for everyone. First of all, it's an economic system. So make sure you count your money and you know what kind of investment you're making because those student loans are crazy. They are. Right? But also um, this space is, is very traumatic. It is a battlefield. It is. It is warfare that we are going through. We are trying to create intellectual space for e each other. And it's hard not to lose your soul in that. Yes. That's true. Okay? Yes. It's true. We live, we live racial battle fatigue every day, every day, right? Mm -hmm. You know, just like a soldier, we have PTSD from my experiences, from my exposure, from the limited, from being the only, for being the resource, for being the blame. We live it, you know. We live it. Thank you, thank you both so. Oh, thank you, thank you for having us here this uh, evening. Y'all, we could talk all night because this is fam. <laughs> Um, and I'm, I'm, it's such an honor, deep bow to, to both of you. It's just always a pleasure. You, you know that. And, you know, I look up to you both, as you know, um, all the work you do, I still, you know, speak very highly of you both, um, as always. And, you know, for, for our listeners, thank you for tuning in this week. Um, I hope you, uh, heard a lot of gems, I heard a lot of truths and a lot of passion you know and that's what it was today it was yeah. passion and truth <laughs> and we really appreciate you for tuning in and just continue to do the work and yep. sometimes there's cost to doing the work and you just got to pay it <laughs> unfortunately that's what we live in but thank you for tuning in and we'll see y'all next week thank you guys